Continuing on with Chapter 18, we're taking a look at this conflict between North and South over the expansion of slavery into the Western territories and possibly into uh, the southern part of Central America and South America. Now, remember, those Southern fire eaters, those pro-slavery advocates, are looking to be able to expand slavery into new territories. They want to have the political power that comes along with creating new states that allow slavery. Uh, Nicaragua was a bust, as we've already talked about, so why not take a look at Cuba? Cuba, to many of these pro-slavery Southerners, was an obvious place to go, that it's their manifest destiny. It also didn't hurt that Cuba already had slaves there and was very close uh, to the southern tip of Florida. So many of these pro-slavery advocates set their sights on Cuba as a possible place to take control of and add to the Union. So during Polk's administration, he had actually offered to pay Spain $100 million to buy uh, the country uh, or the, the territory of Cuba. He was absolutely refused by Spain. But that doesn't mean it's at an end. In 1850 and 1851, we see two filibustering expeditions to try to seize control of Cuba. Now, once again, similar to William Walker's expedition into uh, Nicaragua, these are regular Americans raising an army to try to take control of Cuba on their own. Both times they were pushed back by the Spanish uh, forces. But this also made Spain extremely angry, and in retaliation, in 1854, they took control of the American steamship, uh, the Black Warrior. Now, this could have been a potential opening uh, for the new president, uh, Pierce, to come in and take control, but he wanted to make sure that he had enough of a legitimate reason to take control of Cuba without inflaming the issues in Europe and without inflaming the issues here at home. And so... Uh, the president at the time, Franklin Pierce, ordered his U.S. diplomats that had been stationed in Spain, England, and France to come together to hold a secret meeting in Ostend, Belgium, to come up with recommendations for how he could legitimately seize control of Cuba without irritating all of Europe uh, and getting them on uh, their bad side. Their, uh, their secret plan was called the Ostend Manifesto. This was meant to be uh, the recommendation by these people who obviously knew what was going on in Europe as a way to take control of Cuba without arousing suspicions uh, within Europe. Um, what, they, what they recommended was that the U.S. government offer Spain $120 million. And if they didn't take it, they would be justified then to seize it by using that black warrior ship as a possible um, uh, excuse. However, this manifesto, which was meant to be secret, was leaked. And when the North found out about what had been discussed in Ostend, Belgium, they became extremely enraged. They said that this was just a ridiculous justification for a land grab in order to gain more territory uh, in which slavery could be expanded. They were already mad over the Fugitive Slave Law, so this only added to this domestic unrest going on in the U.S. Now, because Pierce was unwilling to deal with a conflict between the North and the South at this time, he abandoned his claim on, uh, on Cuba, and this became a moot point. Now, another issue dealt with railroads. Um, California has recently become a state at this time. In order to get uh, the products and the people out to these western territories and the new western state, we need a more viable means of transportation. You know, moving on the overland trails in covered wagons is not a great way to get there. You know, you see a very high death rate on the Oregon Trail and the other uh, likewise trails going over uh, the Sierra Nevada mountains and whatnot. It's a very long journey to go by boat around South America. That's also not a viable option. So the real solution is to build a transcontinental railroad, a railroad that would run from the east to the west and would allow uh, the population to grow out in these western territories and states. But we can't build two. So where is this railroad going to be built? Is it going to be built in the north or is it going to be built in the south? Now, from a southern perspective, they really felt that a, a railroad could boost their economy. It would give them more influence, it would give them more power, and this could be a huge advantage to them. And so, um, in 1853, uh, 
James Gadsden was sent down to Mexico to negotiate a purchase agreement with the country of Mexico. This is the Gadsden purchase. Now, the reason that James Gadsden was sent to buy this land was because the optimal place for a railroad to be built in the south would have required going through a very thin strip of land in the northern portion of Mexico. We therefore needed to buy this thin strip of land in order for a railroad to be built down there. We paid $10 million for the Gadsden Purchase. This shows you how important building a railroad was to the South. Now, from a Northern perspective, they also wanted to have a railroad through the Northern Territory. The most optimal position for a Northern Railroad would have had to go through uh, the unorganized free soil territory of Nebraska. Now, there was no way the South was going to allow this to happen. They said an unorganized territory is obviously not as safe, and so therefore it should go through the South. Here you see the orange part. This is the Gadsden Purchase. $10 million for that little uh, sliver of land. Compare that to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and the Mexican Cession, in which we paid uh, $18 million. So the Northerners obviously wanted their own railroad, and they couldn't argue with the South that a Northern railroad would have had to go through this uh, unorganized territory of Nebraska. It's obviously not as safe. So the solution is, let's organize Nebraska. Well, the South was never going to go for that, to organize Nebraska into a territory, because it would have just given uh, more credence to building this railroad up north. And so Democratic Senator from Illinois, Stephen Douglas, known as the Little Giant, he had a stake in the game that if a railroad was built through the Nebraska Territory, it would have ultimately gone through Chicago. Now, other than being the Illinois Senator, uh, Stephen Douglas also had a lot of property in Chicago, so he stood to make a lot of money by building a railroad in the North. So he wants to sweeten the deal for the South to get them to agree to organizing uh, Nebraska so that a railroad could be built. So he proposed what's called the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Let's take the territory of Nebraska and split it in half and create a northern territory known as Nebraska and a southern territory called Kansas. And let's allow popular sovereignty for both of these two territories. Now, the thought here was that since uh, Nebraska was west of the free soil state of Iowa, they would obviously vote to be free soil. And since the newly created um, territory of Kansas was west of the slave state of Missouri, they would probably vote for slave. Now, the reason that this was enticing was because it's opening the door to allow for more slavery out in the western territories. This would have violated the Missouri Compromise of 1820 because this territory is north of the 3630 line. Now, to Northerners, the Missouri Compromise was kind of this massive thing, this massive creation as a way to keep the peace. But the reality was it was just an act of Congress, easily broken by a new piece of legislation. But from the Northerners' perspective, this is a breach of faith. Many Northerners saw Douglas as a traitor, uh, and they are going to be done with compromising for a while. Now, lasting consequences of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, because they did. They created a northern uh, territory of Nebraska and to the south of that, a territory of Kansas. This is leading us on a downward spiral towards the Civil War. Both sides are going to be very um, reticent about compromising in the future because the fear is we compromise today. Who's to say you're not going to turn around 10 years from now and change it willy-nilly? Uh, the North also started more actively denying the enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Law, which only angered the South even more. And this issue over the Kansas-Nebraska Act absolutely split the Democratic Party um, between the North and the South. And in fact, the Democrats won't uh, be able to elect another president for 28 years uh, after the Civil War. This also spurred the creation of the modern-day Republican Party. The Republican Party started out as a minor third party, focusing on free soiler uh, uh, sentiments. It attracted uh, members from the Whig Party, specifically those conscious Whigs like Abraham Lincoln. Uh, it attracted Northern Democrats, uh, irritated with their party for the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Free soilers and know-nothings to create the Republican Party, whose focus is on stopping the spread of slavery out 
out west. Now, they very quickly went from a third, uh, minor third party uh, to very much being a huge contender. In fact, they elected a Speaker of the House from the Republican Party in 1856. It became a major party very, very quickly. However, this was a sectional party. The Republican Party was not voted for in the South for many, many, many years. This absolutely was a northern party. Here you see where this proposed Kansas-Nebraska territory is. Uh, you see, notice on here where Kansas and uh, Nebraska are, definitely north of the 3630 line, which violated that Missouri Compromise. But nonetheless, it was passed by Congress. And that is it for Chapter 18.